So you're here. I mean, the book's a year old now. Congratulations. Happy birthday to the book. Thank you. The Myth of Normal. Uh, we talked about it when it was new. We'll talk about it again. It's been 19 years, uh, 19 years, 19 weeks. It will be 19 years. I wish. On the New York Best Times, <laughs> uh, New York Times bestseller list. Also interpreted into 35 languages, 35 countries. It's doing really well. Um, but you're here for speaking engagements and workshops. Tell us yeah. a bit more about that. Yeah, so um, on Monday I did a workshop, a trauma healing workshop, actually, to people from all over the world. It was very deep, um, very moving. It's quite astonishing how people, when they feel safe, how they open up, yeah. and also how they support each other. You know, so um, um, you know, um, I met you know, um, I met uh, when I was there, I met Charlie McKesey and his book, The Boy, the Mole, the Fox, and the Horse. Amazing, and. The horse is the, uh, it's a, just a charming, beautiful book, and the uh, horse is the wisest creature amongst the four, and he's asked, what's the most courageous thing you've ever said, and the horse says, help. Yeah. And I was crossing the Westminster Bridge yesterday, and there was a little stick-up sign pinned on the, on the gate, on the fence there, yeah. which said, asking for help is a strong thing to do yeah yeah you know? Charlie, Charlie says in the book um, and, some and, people and think so, so people asking for help and coming together that's what really excites me yeah no good for you um, Gabo with the book The Myth of Normal can you expand on the title for us first please sure so as a medical doctor I'm trained to uh, work with what's called a range of normal uh, parameters so within a range of temperature life is possible if it's the temperature too low or the body temperature too high you die Blood acidity, blood blood pressure, a range of normal is natural and healthy outside of which you die. In this society, we assume that a lot of things that we take for granted that we see as normal, we also assume that they're healthy and natural. I'm saying that in this society, what is considered normal is actually toxic for a lot of people, and it's a source of a lot of uh, a lot of illness, uh, pathology of mind and body. So that um, if in a laboratory um, a scientist was growing microorganisms in a brew we'd call that a, a laboratory culture if a lot of these organisms were getting sick or not doing well we'd say it's a toxic culture in British society in North American society in global society there's more um, depression and anxiety are the fastest growing diagnosis more and more kids are being diagnosed with ADHD. There's more autoimmune disease. There's something about this culture that's toxic. So what we consider normal is actually not healthy or natural in this society. That's the meaning of the title. And that goes something towards the definition of, definition of epigenetics as well. Yeah. So epigenetics is the way that the environment affects the functioning of our genes. Like we always assume there's an assumption in this society that people's character traits and behaviors are genetically determined or that the mental health conditions are genetically programmed they're not it's actually the environment working on the genes which is called epigenetics that determines how our brains function and how we function very often so we are not genetically determined creatures in fact there's one scientist who i quote who said that we're genetically determined not to be genetically determined and really what affects us most is our environment, the, our, our social relationships, our personal relationships, our childhoods, and the culture that we live in. Yeah, and our mindset, and just how we wake up in the morning, and it all serves to our cortisol levels, our biochemistry. Um, you talk about Native Americans and the, um, the higher rate of alcoholism through generations, things like that, which obviously lead to, uh, massively detrimental to your overall well-being. Can you just give us a few examples of real-life scenarios? Well, I'll give you one. Uh, I'm, I'm I know you can't see this on radio, but you see this uh, wristband that yeah. I'm wearing. This comes from Haida Gwaii. Haida Gwaii is uh, islands in northern British Columbia. It used to be known as the Queen Charlotte Islands. Now that tells a story because it, it's where the totem poles come from. It's a place of deep culture. People have been living there for 13,000 years. The British come along. All of a sudden, it's no longer Haida Gwaii. It's Queen Charlotte Islands. So they, they get colonially taken over. Then they established these residential schools where native kids, Haida Gwaii kids, are taken to drive their culture out of their brains. I led a, The reason I'm wearing this bracelet is because three weeks ago I led a trauma healing workshop up there. 
an 80-year-old woman came up to the front and she said, I used to speak perfect Haida until I was five years old and now I can't remember a word and uh, even when I try to learn it, it doesn't stick. I said, what happened to you? She was taken to a residential school, a colonial residential school established by the Canadian government but with a colonial mentality bequeathed by the British. She spoke her native tongue. They beat her body with a stick. They literally beat her language out of her. Now these people, this is what happened to the indigenous people in Canada. The result is that, uh, and there was sexual abuse in these schools, physical abuse, a lot of kids died in these schools. Now they have a high rate of alcoholism, suicide, violence, childhood sexual abuse, addictions, self-cutting, um, rheumatoid arthritis. This is a population that, where none of those conditions used to exist. It's strictly a result of collective historical trauma imposed by colonialism. And um, that's just one example. You know, and, and you talk about capital T and small t, uh, yeah. tra the capital T of, cap of the capital T trauma. Yeah, and small t trauma, but both are equally as important. And yeah. it, you know, it's it's uh, it's endemic around the world in different flavors, if you like. Yeah, yeah. Um, the the small t trauma is not when, like the, this woman who came up, and by the way, this elderly Heidegger woman, um, her biggest pain wasn't just what happened to her, but she actually blamed herself for being passive, for being helpless. Yeah. And the, the, the worst impact of trauma is that you start to loathe yourself and to question your worth as a human being. Mm -hmm. And I helped her to understand that her passivity in the face of this beating was her way of survival. Because yeah. had she fought back as a five-year-old, yeah. she would have been grievously hurt even more. That's the big T trauma where things happen to you that shouldn't have happened. The small T trauma, what I call small T trauma, is where not when terrible things happen that shouldn't have, but when the good things that should happen shouldn't and th didn't, didn't happen. So, for example, kids need to be held. Yeah. They need to be emotionally and physically held. When that doesn't happen, they still get wounded, which is the word what the trauma means, is, is it's a wound. So we can hurt kids not by doing bad things to them, but just by not giving them what they need. Yeah. You know, and when I interviewed Prince Harry earlier this year, this is the point a lot of people didn't get. They said, how could this guy be traumatized? He grew up in uh, gilded palaces and misprivileged, which is all true. Privilege, by the way, which he acknowledges, came from wealth that was based on what happened to colonize people internationally. Uh, he shouldn't have said that. No, he's giving out the secret of the the the, the source of the wealth of the British royalty. Yeah. It's, a, it's a big mistake. I'm, 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 I'm being facetious. But, but he was a child who wasn't held. In that family, there was no holding of children. They think, how can you be traumatized in the midst of all this wealth? Yeah. Well, you can be, because as an infant, you need to be held. And in that family, they just didn't hold each other. And it's, you know, again, a, di a different, another example of a similar um, trauma, but for different reasons would be like socioeconomic. So there's that story, lovely story you tell about um, Greek adolescence versus Swedish adolescence. Actually, it was uh, Greek versus British. Uh, it was during the economic crisis in Greece, um, which is, goes back to the point that Society affects our physiology. Right. Um, we think we're independent creatures, but actually very social creatures, and our very physiology is often determined by social factors. So there was an economic crisis in Greece, and the Greek. There was a study comparing Greek and British, um, I think, college age or adolescents yeah. or college age students, and the, the the Greek kids during the economic crisis not only were more anxious naturally, but their stress hormone levels were abnormal compared to their British counterparts, which means that under social pressure, economic crisis, uh, uncertainty, conflict, lack of information, loss of control, which, which are endemic in this society, people's physiology is affected. So poor mothers, so in Canada, for example, women under economic pressure, their children had abnormal co uh, stress hormone levels so that the economic worries of the parents affect the physiology and the immune system and the hormones of the child, which later on can result in illness. 
and then think, why did this kid get sick? Well, it had to do with the social, economic, and cultural circumstances under which they grew up. So as things get more complicated, as we continue to age and develop, evolve, or even devolve as a species, as yeah. human beings, you know, complicated is hard enough to deal with anyway. But when things become complex and have sort of invisible variables as time goes on, how on earth do you unpick this on a global level? Well, the first thing is to recognize it. Yeah. Um, the things that I'm saying about trauma and its impacts have been studied voluminously and published tens of thousands of times. The average physician doesn't get any of this information in medical school. Yeah. Um, the uh, Richard Bentall, a British psychologist, member of the British Academy, said that the link between childhood adversity and adult mental health problems is as clearly established as the link between smoking and lung cancer. Yeah. The average psychiatrist doesn't have a clue. Mm -hmm. So that the first, it's not their fault, it's not part of the medical ideology. And so that the first thing you have to do is you have to talk about it and just to recognize it. Um, in this society, there's a huge pushback against the very idea of talking about trauma. And, and so that the first thing you have to do is just to be very open and honest about it. You, know? and you talk about medical students, don't you? Yeah, medical yeah. students have rarely given a single lecture in their whole education in trauma and yet when they become doctors they are often amongst the most traumatized themselves well there's an interesting study about medical students uh, there's a structure called telomeres telomeres are uh, dna structures at the end of our chromosomes just like the aglets at the end of my shoelaces to keep the strands from unraveling so we have these telomeres which is just a biological structure, they shorten and fray as we are stressed as we get older. They compared the telomeres of medical students and other people their age. The medical students' telomeres, chromosomes, aged more rapidly in a year than people their age. So student medical students grow up with a lot of stress. So they, a, they are aging quicker, even in their teens, than, the, than in teens. In their early 20s or late teens, so that under the pressure, but, but they never learn to take care of themselves, nor do they learn about the trauma and its physiological impacts despite all the evidence, you know? So that um, the very profession that ought to be cognizant of all this is totally unaware of all this research which is really remarkable i read the guardian this morning there was an article about breast cancer uh, this is breast cancer awareness week now in 1870 a british surgeon very famous still renowned in medical circles james paget said that pointed out the relationship between breast cancer and women and emotional factors studies after studies have shown that um stress um, emotional repression, um, um, l emotional loss pr promotes the growth of breast cancer. The average medical student never hears that. And this article in The Guardian, of course, said nothing about it. Yeah. Even though since Paget's day, we have all kinds of research to support his findings. And this is across the board. So that the, the Western medicine separates the mind from the body. Yeah. An average physician just doesn't get this information. Yeah, It's not their fault. It's just not part of the medical ideology. You talked about um, somebody from the past there, Padgett. Tell us about this play, Mark Ryan's play. You the play that I saw last yeah. night. Well, it, it actually relates. So uh, the, the wonderful, transcendent British actor, Mark Rylance, stars in this play called Dr. Semmelweis. Yeah. Now, Semmelweis was a Hungarian physician. He was one of my heroes growing up. In Budapest, where I grew up, there's a statue of him. Now, he, to make a long story short, Semmelweis, working in Vienna, noticed that the women giving birth on the wards where doctors did the deliveries were dying in much higher numbers of, of sepsis, of infection, than the women delivered by the midwives on another ward. And he finally put two and two together. And he noticed that um, the doctors would be coming to, from doing their autopsies, working with infected corpses, not wash their hands, and deliver babies. So he said there must be some particle that we passed on from these autopsy bodies to the women that kills them. And he started washing his hands and suggested that doctors do. And the death rate went down. He was hounded out of the profession. 
he ended up dying in a mental health hospital. Now, um, it's the medical profession is very conservative. Now, and then of course, twenty years later, Sir Joseph Lister, the British scientist, surgeon, and physician, comes along and says, "There's germs, and germs cause infections. You have to wash your hands." So Semmelweis's insight, he didn't have the science, but he had the insight, was then validated by this great British scientist and physician, Lister, uh, whose, photo, whose painting I saw at the National Portrait Gallery a couple of days ago. But he himself died in an anus, insane asylum. Okay. So he's one of my heroes. Yeah. He's one of these people that dares challenge the medical orthodoxy. And uh, how, how good is the play? Sorry? How good was the play? Very dramatic, very powerful, and um, a real combination of um, incredible acting, of course, and uh, and dance and music, and yeah, yeah. Uh, just very impactful. Your sense of purpose seems to be, uh, you know, as as um, formidable as anybody I've ever met or read about. Mm. Is that how you feel every morning when you wake up? Do you feel uh, a responsibility to to come out on shows like this, to have workshops, travel around the world, to just be responsible all the time? If so, where did it come from? And do you ever get to relax and smile and, and take it easy? So this year has been a hard year for me because, uh, you know, so I've got this best-selling book and I'm traveling all over the world and meanwhile I'm ignoring my own needs. Right. Uh, I mean, I'm... I'm, I'm, I'm uh, I've written a book called When the Body Says No. When you don't take care of yourself, when you don't say no, the body will say it for you in the form of illness. And sometimes people come to me and say, your book saved my life. And my response is, maybe I should read it myself. <laughs> because I really drove myself too hard this year. Right. you know. And I got quite anxious and, uh, and sometimes depressed and demoralized in the midst of all this success. Yeah, yeah. You know? And then I did something radical. Um, this summer I did a two-week uh, sabbatical from um, the internet, cell phones, emails, yeah. YouTube, you know, and I started to meditate and do yoga, yeah. and boy, oh boy, what a transformation, you know, so the answer is yes, but I have to be <laughs> conscious of it, because with all that I know and all that I teach about stress and trauma, I can do it to myself, yeah. uh, unless I'm very uh, conscious and mindful, you know. Yeah. No, as to what keeps me going, look, I just really believe in the truth of what I'm talking about and the importance of it, and uh, I don't care who agrees with me or who doesn't, and uh, I just want to speak my truth. I'm in a fortunate position of people being interested. So, you know, from here tomorrow, I go to Glasgow, where I'll be speaking to hundreds of people. Then I go to Eastern Europe, former Yugoslavia, and then Transylvania, and Hungary, Prague, and I get to speak my truth. So, I mean, what a fortunate person I am. As long as I take a breath and smile and, and take care of myself. And yeah. if I don't, all this external activity and success just turns to ashes in my mouth. It's yeah, what is simple. success anyway? Yeah, you know, that's right. A smile goes a long way when you're trying to convey a Yeah, message. you know what? And um, I basically, I'm a depressive. Like I grew up with a depressive constitution based on very early experiences. I, it wasn't a lot of joy in my first years of life. And people would often look at my face and say look why does it look so dour you know and i didn't even realize it as i got older fortunately i, I smile more now you You've know, got a so, lovely smile by the well, way well thanks <laughs> well you know what i've learned something about this phrase growing older have you thought about the phrase growing older like what does it mean to grow older right as opposed to get older right you can actually keep growing grow you yeah. know and and and, and grow when an oak tree grows older it becomes more magnificent doesn't that's it? that's right yeah and stronger so, so we hope so so um I do smile a lot more now. I, I take myself far less seriously than I used to, uh, which also means that life is a lot easier. Yeah. On yeah. a good day, I should say. Um, Yabba Mate with Daniel Mate, his son, the myth of normal trauma, illness, and healing in a toxic culture. Uh, we've only got a, a minute left, sadly, Gabor. This book is a year and a couple of weeks old now, so happy yeah. birthday to the book. Thank you. Um, what has been... Uh, the most useful response to the book and what has been the most surprising response to the book from your point of view? You know, the best feedback I get was summarized by a young man who said to me, thank you, I read my book and I remembered myself. So this book is written, really written to help people understand and connect with themselves. Right. And the essence of trauma is that loss of connection with self. So that's that's the that's my purpose, that's the purpose of this book and that's the feedback I get.
All right. Um, this I know this took a long time to write. It's not your first book. Will it be your last? Is there another one? No. Uh, my son and I, Daniel and I, are now writing a book called Hello Again, A Fresh Start for Parents and Their Adult Children. Because right. we've had our own stuff to work out, believe me. Because my son was traumatized in his childhood by the way I was as a parent. Right. And the way my wife and I related to each other. My kids grew up in a very stressed home. Right. So then we've got a lot of stuff to work out. So now we do a workshop and, and a lot of parents and their adult kids come and they they get a fresh start. And that's, Can't wait for that book. That's, <laughs> that's, <laughs> When's that, that gonna be here? That's, we should finish writing it next year. It should be out in 2025. Please come back and talk about that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well have a safe, smiley day. Thank you, thanks Great so much. Great to see you, man.